It is now when we are called as witnesses to the world to mend it, to change its course, to restore it. It is now when we are called to act on our values, not to hide, not to fear, but to be bold and loud. It is now that we are called to continue the fight for justice, to organize, to speak up. It is now. Let us gather, let us give each other courage, let us worship. Good morning. Welcome this morning to Unitarian Universalist Church West here in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Whatever moved you to be here this morning, in person or virtually, thank you for being here with us. Welcome, each of you. My name is Jeannie Baker, and this is one of the duties I perform as a member of your Board of Trustees. One of the best parts of being a Board of Trustees member is the opportunity of connecting with all of you on a beautiful Sunday morning like this one. This morning, as we often do, we offer gratitude for the privilege of living and gathering on territory inhabited at various times by natives people of the Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Menominee, and Oneida nations, among many others. Those of us who are settlers and newcomers are beholden to recognize that history and lean our hearts into the work of reconciliation and reparation. As a welcoming congregation to gay, lesbian, transgendered, bisexual, and queer plus peoples, we continue to address ongoing homophobia, violence, and targeted legislation. Also, as an anti-racist faith community, we acknowledge that racism throughout our society continues to lead to the violent deaths and oppression of people of color. May we engage in the struggle to dismantle white supremacy culture in our hearts, in our community, and in our world. Whoever you are, and from wherever you come, whatever your age, whatever your color, whatever your gender identity, whomever you love, however you define family, you are welcome here. Um, we gather here united around UU principles. We are a community of communities, spiritual seekers, called to take action by our commitment to justice, united in covenant, and in spirit of love. You are welcome here. Let's do a little housekeeping. If you're new here or visiting this morning, please take a moment to fill out one of the slips you received. They're not yellow anymore, everybody. Um, with your hymnal or drop us a note at visitor at uucw.org. Stop by the visitor table in the community after service and have a chat or speak to anybody with a name tag. We would love to talk to you more about being part of this community. If you're feeling a little antsy today and uh, you'd like to listen to better by having something to do with your hands, you can scoot over to the worship exploration table at any time and do activities while listening attentively to the service. As always, there's a robust list of things going on at church. You have it in your order of service that you might consider participating in. All of these activities are important, but I'm going to highlight a couple. And the first two are not actually on the activities and announcements. Number one, I've been asked to confirm that regular nursery care and summer RE, as, as usually planned, are happening today. So we're going to have the normal singing of the kids out of the sanctuary. That's all going to happen today. And we are today going to have no formal joys and concerns. But of course, you can always, uh, if, if you have a, a, a care or a, curry, uh, um, a heavy heart or a concern, you can always use um, the slip to, to turn into um, Jill, our new reverend, or um, however you wish. Other things on the activities and announcements that I want to put forward for your consideration, we're still under summer office hours, so office hours are a little bit different. It's, it's all listed. And summer communications are a little bit different. Um, the campus team is planning a painting day, uh, Saturday, August 10th, from 9 to 10. They've identified several painting projects, so that's a kind of an interesting uh, verbal 
things. So where are the painting projects? You'll find out if you come next Saturday. Um, and also, it is not too early to think about the auction in November. This is a big money maker for us, and the only reason it's successful is because we make it successful, that we donate, we put our energy behind it. Um, the co-chairs of the auction are Melissa Musante and me. Please talk to us if you have ideas, concerns, questions, you want to be part of a team. Um, now is when we're getting the ball moving for donations and uh, creative ideas. So now that we have the business of coming together squared away, let's settle in and center ourselves as we enter into this time of attending to matters of worth. Eddie? Good morning. My name is Eddie Daniel, and my pronouns are he and him. As a member of the worship ministry team, it is my privilege to be leading the service today. And as a member of the art task force, it is a special privilege to be able to introduce our speaker this morning. Her name is Fatima Laster. Fatima is a self-taught interdisciplinary artist, curator, and the proprietor of Five Points Art Gallery and Studios. In both her independent and communal practices, and with a black American vantage point, Laster approaches racism, sexism, classism, cultural appropriation, and housing and land displacement. Laster's honors include the Wisconsin Artists Biennial of 2022 at the Museum of Wisconsin Art, Wisconsin Triennial Guest Curator, City of Milwaukee Arts Board, Mildred L. Harpole Artist of the Year. On top of all of that, as you may know, Fatima has been serving as a consultant to our art task force. The art task force is charged not only with reinstalling artworks removed during our recent remodeling, but also with creating a more inclusive and inviting visual environment and one that addresses our efforts to be an anti-racist congregation. I expect we'll be hearing more about that in a moment. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to our pulpit, Fatima. Before we go on with the service, I'd like to introduce someone else who was with us today. Our newly settled minister, Jill Braithwaite, is joining us for the first time since she officially began her ministry with UUCW on August 1st. Jill, would you please invite Stan? And now, please rise in body or in spirit to sing hymn number 309, Earth is Our Homeland.
When Unitarian Universalists get together we, to worship, we light a chalice as a symbol of our faith. The flaming chalice represents many things, including the light of reason, the warmth of community, and the flame of hope. If you are joining us from home, I invite you to kindle a flame of your own. The words for this chalice lighting, we come together without creed, are by Maureen Killeran. Please join me in the responsive reading printed in your order of service. Your part is labeled congregation. In this free church, we come together without creed, focusing instead on the core values of justice, equity, and compassion. We come together in shared conviction that all people deserve a voice in matters that concern them, and that it is up to each of us to protect the rights of all, particularly those who, for whatever reason, have long been held in silence. We commit together to affirm in our actions as well as our words of the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. In this free church, we come together without creed, believing that the way we live in the world bears testament to the value of our beliefs. We like this chalice as a beacon of hope for those who have gathered here today, for all who have ever walked through our doors, and for all who will walk through our doors, for all this and for all those things we dare to hope and dream, we kindle our chalice flame this day. Good morning. I'm Dave Cicero. My pronouns are he and his. I'm the director of Lifespan Religious Education here at Unitarian Universalist Church West. Today, I don't really have a story for you per se to share. However, I did decide to take this as an opportunity for me to share a little bit with you a few things that I've learned in my former life as an art teacher. But first, coincidence. I use the word synchronicity a lot. Things happen sometimes in our lives, right? We think, how in the world did those two things come together? What's the connection? Um, I was introduced to Fatima about uh, four or five years ago by my brother, uh, who met her in Chicago, where we're both from. Um, I learned that Fatima went to Washington University, which is where I went to school. Little coincidence, not a big deal, right? Oh yeah, a lot of people go there, but it didn't, doesn't stop there. Shortly after that, Fatima started helping the group um, determine which of, what art 
pieces of art were going back up on the wall after the big remodel and the last capital com campaign and all that kind of thing right before the pandemic set in and everything got delayed and this and that. Um, and as an art teacher, oh, I, oh, okay, sorry, my little notes. Was wrong. I was an art teacher, right? One of the things I did as an art teacher was I helped students, learn, I taught students to read. Not the typical way, right? But how to read artwork, how to read visual symbols and that sort of thing. So, all right, back to coincidences. So Fatima's working with this group. Uh, she's speaking today, great. I'm looking for a story to share during this time for all ages. And I find a book. It's called Art of Protest by Dee Nichols, illustrated by a number of various artists. And as I was putting these slides together, I always put a little bio, right, of the author, what they're, who they are, that sort of thing. <laughs> Guess where Dee Nichols went to school? Washington University. So just crazy, right? How, why did I choose that book? Well, I, I don't see these coincidences as evidence of a magical force in the universe bringing, <coughs> bringing us all together. Not that I don't believe there might be one, but this is evidence that really we are all interconnected. If we just look hard enough, there's, we have a lot in common. Anyhow, in this book, uh, there's a quote by Nina Simone who's a singer, we just sang a song about song, the art of song, sang that hymn. This quote, she says, an artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. And I think many of us are aware that artists, you know, exhibit their talents and that sort of thing, but I think really the best artists do this, they reflect their times. This is not something that's just happened in the last hundred years either. So the pyramids, there's hieroglyphs of, you know, of the pharaohs that maybe not in the most uh, flattering poses. Was that the artists kind of giving their take on the times? This is a 17th century painting by Velazquez. He was a painter for the King of Spain. Uh, I, he's probably not consulted on matters of state, the artist, right? He most definitely was paid and expected to portray the king's family, events of the time, and that sort of thing. But Velasquez was a human being. He had thoughts, he had ideas. Was he able to communicate, say something, through his work that reflected the times? The answer is yes. And art historians have interpreted over the years, right, what's being said here about the royal family of Spain. I'm not gonna go into that here. But um, art historians were able to read what Velazquez had to say, even though it might not have been something that he would have said directly to the royalty. American landscape painters, this is from the 1800s, they depicted the beautiful landscape of this country that was being, um, well, we all know, right, occupied and um, moved into by people who were not here for so long. And it was, it was wonderful for the people in the cities, right, to see the majesty of these, these lands, maybe that they did not have an opportunity to see for themselves. But these artists also, some of them portrayed or communicated an idea that many you use might not really appreciate, right? That God put Europeans here on this continent to inhabit and control these lands. That's the sign of the times. So how do art historians figure these things out? Well, through symbolism. This is a page from D. Nichols' book. Just show some examples. Um, it, and kind of explains where they came from and the paper crane has come to become a symbol for peace. What I didn't know is it was, uh, I think, a survivor of the uh, bombing in Hiroshima who was making these and, that, and made a thousand of them and that sort of became a tradition then. It's not something that's been around forever and ever, but there's a symbol for peace. The peace sign itself. 
anti-nuclear demonstrators. Came up with that, it's become pretty universal. Yellow umbrellas, a clenched fist, started with labor unions, pretty much, has been adopted by other groups who want to just communicate the idea that we have power. Even the rainbow, the rainbow flag um, was invented and has been adapted and changed to reflect the times. Keith Haring was an artist um, who died of AIDS and a lot of his work when he was alive was, this is called silence equals death. And his idea was to get art out to the people. He started out in the subways and on walls and rooftops and that sort of thing. He got uh, co-opted and uh, accepted into the formal art community. However, he did not stop communicating messages that he felt were very important. I don't think I'm going to go into all this, but I imagine <clears throat> that Fatima and the group looking at their artwork was looking at everything, hopefully with new lenses, asking each other, what, what does this symbolize? What does this mean? Is this something that we, UUCW, want to have as our public-facing um, visual statement? Does this reflect our times? So thank you, Fatima, for, for that work and to that group for that work that continues. This book is also, it's also wonderful because every section has sort of an art uh, prompt in it. So I'm, I'm going to leave it on the table over here so some of you can take a look at it later if you like. Um, but the, the author is inviting all of us, not just people trained to do this, but all of us to say something about our times, to communicate. Uh, if that means protest, what's going on, so be it. And there's ways to do that through words and images and that sort of thing. And she invites us here. That the world is ripe for change, for progress, and for new ideas of what tomorrow can bring. So thank you for letting me share that a little bit. And Sophie has agreed to light our lantern for RE and lead us out. So while she does that, I invite you to join me in singing our recessional. As you go, may joy surround you. As you go, go in peace. Know our love is with you all. Hi everyone, my name is Fatima Laster and I want to thank you for welcoming me to your space. Um, as Eddie and some of your other members mentioned, I was um, called to assist as a consultant with um, decolonizing and your anti-racist work within your, your facility and within your art collection. And so this um, brief talk um, or message is entitled Decolonizing One Spirit and Space Through the Arts. Um, I encourage you to look, even though I'm brought here to focus on the arts, to look past just the arts. Um, and that was mentioned during our initial meetings is it's more than just, you know, a general aesthetic, but it's about your own mind, spirit, and behavior. And so the group was charged and challenged and given homework assignments to look inside oneself and see how attached and why you're attached to certain beliefs, certain arts, um, because it's, we had a nice open dialogue about um, which pieces in your facility are um, debated and which ones people have in a hard time rotating out and archiving for yourselves or making sure it's to the forefront and the question is why. And so part of those whys that um, I purported is, you know, we're all a part of the same system. Um, as Dave um, lightly mentioned, we are a part of a colonized country. There were people here before us. And so we, 
kind of eradicated some ideologies, practices, and forced our own. And so what people sometimes don't acknowledge that we benefited from previous behavior and actions and thoughts became um, dominant by diminishing someone else's. And so what we think is high art, beautiful, class, classy, classic, tasteful, and what is appropriate has been um, kind of um, brainwashed into us. It's been forced upon us. And so what I encouraged was to break that down and ask again why, and then also open your mind to other narratives. There are other lives that live in this world, in this community. There are other practices. Why were those practices demonized? And finding beauty and acceptance in others. And so um, that is what your charge is. And then another charge is to um, accept that you have benefited from racism. Racism, is, too, is a constructed, constructed and forced system that created a caste and hierarchy based on pigments at the end of the day. But those pigments were given tropes to help um, create disparity. And so that, again, a power structure could extrapolate, exploit another to somebody else's benefit. That also permeates through your thoughts, to your clothes, to the art, and how you perceive the world and people within it. And so, again, some of our attachments, while we might not believe ourselves to be inherently racist or racist, we have benefited, or you all have benefited from that. And so, again, um, challenging yourself about why you're attached to certain things or why if you walk past or see somebody different, why you might have a visceral reaction um, and what, what triggers that. And then why are you selecting the art you are selecting? Who do you want to embrace? And one of the most difficult things is to accept that you have benefited. And the other thing is listening and being um, meeting people where they are at so that you can learn. Um, I have a quote from Bell Hooks, who's one of my favorite people. And I'm going to ad lib it a little bit, but not really, because she uses the word liberal, but, and that's more political, and it's not about this. But she said, when liberal whites, so I'm extracting liberal, fall to, fail to understand how they can and or do embody white supremacist values and beliefs, even though they may not embrace racism as prejudice or domination, especially domination that involves coercive of control, they cannot recognize the ways their actions support and affirm the very structure of racist, racist domination and oppression they wish to see eradicated. And this speaks directly to the, the work that I'm doing and that my perspective is we may think we're nice, we may think we're not doing harm, but sometimes because of the, the training from the from colonialization and and it's been going on for so long it becomes innate in our culture that we're not aware we're doing harm when we approach someone when they enter spaces that are different or how we go about casting our views instead of embracing someone again meeting them where they at and having um, neutral dialogue to learn about each other your way is not the only way your way is not the right way what you deem is tasteful and classic and proper could be um, completely opposite to someone else. And so we have to be mindful about how we navigate and also be humble if someone tells you, you're doing harm to me, you're making me uncomfortable. Um, you might not be aware, but you are infringing on my beliefs as well. And so when you go out, I'll pause there. You have started to do the work already by acknowledgement. I can tell you from a community that's different than your words have fleeting meaning. And as you mentioned during your opening, you have to have an action-oriented approach to this. You can't be idle. You can't sit. You can't say or put up a Black Lives Matter flag and think um, 
you're doing justice and work. You have to go embrace, you have to go learn, you have to go fail to, to see where you are um, faltering and learn about yourself. Because one of the things about colonial you're teaching someone else your views. Again, you have to learn from someone else and see where you can find middle ground. And there might not be a middle ground, and then that is okay. So with the work that you have started, I help you make the church look more attractive. You have not done the full work of decolonizing your collection because you kept the same stuff. You haven't had the real discussions about what stays and what doesn't. I have placed most of the, the items for you all. Some are still coming. Um, made recommendations aesthetically about an accent wall to highlight the work. But again, as I mentioned in the group, the work is not done yet. You haven't done anything new. You have reintroduced old. You have reintroduced what is existing, but your charge was to be welcoming, embracing, and open and inclusive to others. And that is not in your current collection. And then I know this piece behind that I personally think is aesthetically pleasing, but the story behind it is like it was given to you by a banker or something, or a, a famous architect. And again, aesthetically pleasing, but I said, what is the story? It looks like it's colonized land. <laughs> and I like texture and all that stuff. And it's, I know it's an expensive piece to install. To commission this would be even more expensive. And so people might be attached to that but if you have a more diverse group, and I myself said it looks like it could be colonized terrain, imagine if you're trying to speak to them and reach them, but this is what the, your brand is. It's a conflict. And so that was one, I know this is one of the more debated pieces in your collection. Why are you attached to it? And if it, if it detracts from your mission, is it worth keeping? I don't have the answer. That's your answer. <laughs> That's the discussion for yourselves. But that is a part of that colonial spirit. Like, why am I attached to it? Why is it? And then at the end of the day, you can diminish it. It's just art. You can replace it. There are murals that stay up forever, and then the cycle is we'll commission someone and have a lineage of these murals. And so there's different ways to activate space and activate artists and people of color and other um, marginalized groups. And so the initial, the additional work is to go into spaces humbly <laughs> um, and not enforce your mission on them, but know what your spirit and mission is in your mind is to find and embrace others and you need to um, revamp or add on to your collection and there are different um, art spaces, and meet with the artists, um, talk with the spaces, after um, getting to know them. Because it's not their job to make you feel comfortable. It's your job, again, to meet people where they are and see if there's synergy, and if you will do the work justice by collecting it, buying it, collecting it, adding it to your space, and then making it, using it as a way to connect with a, a general body. So again, it's the action that you have to take on. Um, and it's not solely about just buying, because you have to remember you don't own these people's spirits. You don't, just because you own a piece of art, you don't own them. That is a mentality that's out there. And you don't own the right to um, use derogatory words, too, if you appreciate, appreciate the art. And so, again, finding that balance of respect and honoring the people and not just using it as a tokenistic um, action to make yourself look anti-racist. I call it the DEI movement going on, and it's still um, perpetuating um, racist behavior. And, and it's used as a mask to say you're not. So the, it is an action. I will um, close with one other quote, and it's by Audre Lorde, another favorite. And these are all black female identifying, but some are queer and have in other. 
and all those um, subsets, I guess, of living are within different people of color and cultures as well. And so there is racism that <laughs> perpetuates and evade, invades um, the LGBTQI community and elsewhere. And it is within the class system as well. So Audre Lorde quotes, our persistence in examining the tensions within diversity encourages growth toward our common goal. So often we either ignore the past or romanticize it, render the reason for unity useless or mythic. We forget that the necessary ingredient needed to make the past work for the future is our energy in the present, metabolizing one into the other. Continuity does not happen automatically, nor is it a passive process. She's speaking to action to create community and harmony within diversity. And you have to appreciate that for what it really is. We don't have to be the same to work together, but we have to find a commonality in human respect and spirit to be able to work together. And by doing that, you have to acknowledge some of the the prejudices that might be inherent in you and acknowledge that you have benefited from our structures and, and also acknowledge that people who have been oppressed have also absorbed some of them. And so um, finding that ways to communicate without blame but acceptance, like we are benefiting from this to move forward, but you still have to move forward through action. And so now I'm gonna let Eddie um, introduce me the question and answers. And don't be shy. So, uh, are we on? No. Okay, all right. So uh, we haven't had a polylog or talk back as we're calling it in quite a while. Just a couple of uh, administrative points about it. Um, first, the, the Art Task Force brought up the idea of including a, um, a talk back in order to hopefully increase the engagement of you all. Uh, because this is an issue that isn't just something we'd like you to hear about, we'd like everyone to be totally committed to. Um, and when I spoke to Fatima about it, she was all over that. So it, it was very nice that, that we were in, uh, in uh, sympathetic agreement with uh, this idea of having the talk back. But as far as how it works, so raise your hand and wait for either me or Lee to bring you a microphone uh, and then feel free to ask your question. We have allowed a substantial amount of time for this. So please don't, as she says, don't be shy. Thank you. Uh, I'm the chair of this committee and I just wanna say thank you again. You gave us a great education all the way through um, and um, helped us to look at ourselves each of our committee members is at a different point in going through anti-racism. And um, I'm, I'm just so interested in the art itself and, and I, I'm just wondering if it would be possible to have some shows here of artists in our social room um, and and I'm thinking about things like having artists of different cultures and backgrounds get together and be given a word like bars and then each one makes their own artwork and then explains it explains what it means to them but um, I'm, I'm saying this because you inspired us. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm thinking all the time about the, the ways that we look at ourselves as white people and how that can change as we learn more and as we intermingle. Intermingling is absolutely crucial. Thank you so much for coming today.
Hmm? Yeah. Uh, Thank you for having me. Um, so you mentioned something like there's different um, stations where people are with this, and that is normal. And one of the homework assignments was to have that dialogue amongst yourselves. <laughs> because you represent a group and you wanna be united in how you approach things. Um, and you, again, you have to accept or you have to acknowledge like where you are. And some people will not change, they're, they're stubborn, they're rigid, and um, they're entitled to be that, but you don't want that to conflict with the actions that you need to do, the work that you need to do and you're claiming you're gonna do, because um, you will look like the status quo. Again, the DEI facade. We're doing this, but then if someone comes here, it's met with resistance and you do more harm for your own brand. And so, um, and then I'll get back to your other question, another homework assignment. The, the art group was meeting separately from your general anti-racist group, and if I'm saying the name wrong, forgive me, but there's two groups. You were meeting separately, and you weren't communicating that well. I said, how did the, does that work? You're a team, you're a unit, and if you all don't have um, synergy and alignment with how you're approaching things, again, it's gonna be a conflict within that. So um, that was another homeless thing. You should be meeting together so that you can agree or disagree and then bring it back and we'll figure out a resolution if there can be one. Or figure out some people might need to be rotated out of the roles that day. And those are real things. Um, as far as bringing artists here, artists are not a monolith. Um, Everyone is different with their approaches of where they, what the work that they make and where they show. Um, there are religious spaces in the, that might try to host it, but some, I have worked with artists, they don't like, I don't wanna be in a church. But there are some that say okay. And it's also about um, who you approach, like what's the purpose? I think the most appropriate thing is you go to them, you go find them again, and then you establish a rapport and relationship like you're invested in them because one of the easiest and almost lazy thing to do is bring people to you. You don't have to invest in the gas. It's not easy to get out here. I have the luxury of a vehicle and even I'm like calculating the gas to get to and from. Um, I don't know if the buses come out here the buses stop at the county line about three blocks east of here. Okay. And so if you're dealing with artists with um, health issues or disabilities, you know, three blocks for me, I'm like, I can listen to music and walk maybe, but not carry art, you know? Um, so it's not a convenient way. I think you need to go to the people first and um, not do a catch-all. This is what we want here is about going to them and um, relating to them and seeing if you want to work with them and not, um, and you don't have to do it immediately by. It is a process, you need to go to space and build up a rapport and trust at the forefront. And then maybe get some work and then see, okay, they're invested in us, then it's worth us coming out to this place that is, wasn't built for people of color. Like sub, the suburbs were not, they were intentionally built to keep everybody in the city and they took all the economic resources from the city, even though they still benefit from the city, but that's what it was. And so there are police situations to get out here and then global community ideologies that might differ from where your church, but what they hear is Brookfield and then all these associations that they have with Brookfield. And so go to the people first and then look to trying to promote your own exhibition. 
Yeah, thank you for coming and uh, uh, highlighting this issue for us. And uh, I try to be sensitive to it. I've done a lot of reading about civil rights, but comment quickly. What what should be what would we what should we be aware about with our mural? I don't. You don't have that much history behind it. Like, what does it represent? I know the story about how you acquired it. Okay. And that was like the forefront, but it's like, what does it represent? And then that's the dialogue you have amongst yourselves. And then when you start um, bringing in, again, more diverse um, members, it's the dialogue that you might have to have. Like, what does it represent? Versus, you know, it's aesthetically pleasing and it's, you know, associated with a historical bank, and banks have their own issues with um, exploitation and redlining and predatory loans in certain communities. So, you know, it's like, oh, okay, you're just passing along wealth um, amongst each other, and that's all you care about is like how expensive and this piece looks, and oh, it's associated with this rich person. Okay, so I'm gonna stay on the mural. Um, so thinking like people that come into our church and see the mural don't know the background, and maybe you didn't know the background when you came in, but what I was curious about was um, you felt like it was, um, you had a very different interpretation of this. I didn't know the background and my interpretation of this was like the beginning of the world. It just looks like things going on in the beginning of the world. But yours was about slavery or something, of taking over or something. I, I don't know. But I was curious where you got that from if, if you didn't know the back of it. I'm just, again, curious. So I didn't mention slavery at all. I'm sorry. So whatever it was. It was but, the, but I'm glad you said that because that's the part of the communication is like the listening. And I'm not saying you're not good, but it's like what you hear versus what was said. And um, I'm, a, I'm a visual artist too, and I, I am more abstract leaning, or I started as that. And so things are open to interpretation, even if the artist renders it a certain way. Like this could be about neurons. Truthfully, like we don't know. This person loved science and how the brain works and how everything is kinetic and like, and it could be about synergies and relationships through neurons and like minimalizing, getting down to that micro level and then global humanity across through neurons. Like that will heal us all once all the synergies are made. It could be about that. And so, but that's where the dialogue comes in. And so, if it, I don't have an opinion on what you do with this. Um, I know this is a debated piece, and that's all. I don't have an opinion. It's what you decide to do with your work, with what is presented to you as advice. And so, what I'm saying is, if you're bringing in different members who find harm in it, then that needs to be considered. If you're really trying to do that work. And then why are you attached to it? And you had a different um, thought process or assumption about the work than I did. But I also said I thought it was aesthetically pleasing, but then the deeper level is like, what does it represent? And so that representation counts too. And if no one knows the story, and it's all these loose debated um, conflicts and com conversations around it. Once the, the body diversifies, if it's gonna really diversify, then it needs to be considered like, what is the true mission? What's the end goal? Like, do we wanna divide our space and not align with our mission to keep a art piece? Or can we have a discussion about how to, what it should be? Uh, I'd just like to introduce the word projective device. This is a straightforward projective device, and I think that's what you were saying. I, I just thought I would name it. 
So different people are going to see different things in it. I had a, I have a friend who uh, came here, and she doesn't, she has never, she's Jewish, she's never believed me that this isn't a Christian church, and she sees a Madonna figure over there, which she just would not let go. And you see what you see. There's no right or wrong, and you see what you see. So it's a, I just want to enter the term projective device, that's all. Right. There's no right or wrong unless the conversation conflicts with the mission. So the art piece itself is neutral as of now until people project their opinions on it. Um, especially with no one really, no one has told me the backstory besides how you inherited it. So that's the issue, is like what are you really attached to? It's an expensive piece. People get attached to money. But imagine how much your if if it needed to be if it needed to be swapped out, how much your congregation could grow and how many people you can reach by showing like we're not attached to money. Cause that's what our our system is, that's the racism, that's the classism, it's all about capital, it's all attached to money. And that's the value system versus like a human spirit value. Thank you, Fat Fatima. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I want to um, comment on uh, some uh, permission that you gave me, and you said, it's just art. And I just love that. It's just art. Um, I'm Lynn Capitan. Uh, I'm an artist. And to me, art is like, it's central in my life. It's so important, right? And um, the mural and other art pieces, I think of the piece back there by Sally Hap Hackbarth, um, for me, art uh, <clears throat> art isn't just objects, <clears throat> they're relationships. So when I come in and I see the mural, I am re, uh, re familiarizing myself with a relationship. I've had the relationship with the mural for as long as it's been there. And I think of Sally when I see her artwork. So there's these relationships, emotional attachments, and all these things that come in with this that enter into it. So when you say, it's just art, you could let it go. Why are you attached to it? And I think, well, because they're my relationships. But the key learning for me and what you said is sometimes I have to let go of my relationships. Sometimes uh, as my life changes and my relationships changes, I discover oh, I don't know if I want this relationship anymore. I don't know if this is important to me in the same way as it used to be. I've shifted, I've grown. I wish you have grown, you haven't grown, you've hurt me. I don't know if I can keep this relationship. So, you know, I, I guess I'm hearing that in what you're saying as well, that we can really examine this. And remember, this is just an art piece. It carries all this incredible em energy and emotion but we have a um, relationship with it. And how do we want that to be going forward, not just being attached to the past? And I didn't want to demean, I'm an artist through and through, and I've, I collect, I buy art, and I make art. And I know the history of plunder of art. So it's stuff in the world that people don't know exists or was stolen and are hidden in our museums. There's a love-hate relationship with museums, too. And so um, art is a way, like Dave mentioned, of documenting a practice or the times or some part of history or culture. And there has been true eradication of an existence of people. So it is important, but this right now is like, it becomes a material thing. And so people get, why are you attached to it is the question. And if you don't have the history behind it, what is the attachment? It's an attachment to aesthetic or the gift of it and the monetary. That's what it comes down to at this point. And again, if your goal is to be inclusive, and I don't want to keep talking about this piece. I not <laughs> regret it. I don't regret because I knew it was the, but that's what I was trying to highlight. Why are you attached to a piece that you don't have a history to? You mentioned history in a relationship. Your relationship is from seeing it all over the for this long of time and oh, you were fortunate to be bequested this expensive thing that you probably couldn't afford. And I'm not, I don't know anybody's trying but you know, it's an expensive, we can acknowledge it. it's textured and everything. And the installation I'm sure was expensive because I've had work installed too. But 
that is not like a true human connection. That's um, a process that a business exchange. And so again, you don't want to demean people just to that. Like you value them based on like inheriting something. No one can say my great grandfather who was this and did that and, and it represents, there's not, I have not heard once yet. That's history behind this piece. And there could be other pieces in the, the space like that too. People are just attached, like somebody give through this to me. I have friends who are hoarders and they're like my mom and I was like, your mom's spirit is within you. You're doing harm to your mind, your space, by keeping it, and you're not even activating it. So um, people f can find excuses to keep, but again, like what is that attachment? And you have to see if it's, again, aligned with your goal is to be inclusive and have proper anti-racist dialogue with someone else or in, you know, more inclusive dialogue with someone else. Hi, Hi. my name is Carol O'Nelson. I'm an uh, original member of this church, mm -hmm. and I feel the need to correct a couple of things. Um, originally, you would have been standing in front of a blank white wall, Fatima, and we purchased the string sculpture to go on that wall that you recommended go on the back wall, and we still have not, the committee has still not made a decision about that. I'm on the Arts Task Form, uh, Arts Task Committee. I am an artist, and I need to tell you that the cost of the Jordi Bonet thing has absolutely nothing to do with it in regard to this church. Um, he's, an, uh, he's a Canadian artist. Uh, one-armed, if you believe that, did he create this work. And we were fortunate enough, in my view, to be gifted it for the cost of transporting it by truck from its original home. We had to pass the hat to, to get enough money to get the truck to bring it down here and stack it along that north wall. And it was installed uh, by, committed, by church members. We did it on our own with many shims because we discovered a vertical wall is not flat. <laughs> uh, so that's how it, it came to be. And we considered it good fortune. I have always liked the fact that it is non-representational because our church, Unitarian Universalism, has each of us find our own spiritual path. We are a group of individuals. To me, that represents our individuality because all people find different things in it. I've been looking at it ever since it was installed. I still find different things when I'm here on a Sunday morning and my mind wanders. <laughs> so um, that's the background. To me, it represents the values of Unitarian Universalist Church West. And I'd like to have that known. Thank you. Thank you. So. Well, it reiterates what we've been talking about, about um, people interpreting it as they see it. Um, cost is not just monetary, it, it comes in sacrifice too with labor. And so it's still an attachment to how you got it. You mentioned the cost of transport and that you all toiled with labor to get it installed. So there's still an attachment to that, but no one has told me the true history. I know artists who, who make phenomenal work and they have one arm. And I'm not diminishing him, but that's not the history of the piece. And I too make abstract work and it's non-representational, which means it lacks true form, but it doesn't necessarily lack a message. And so that's what it comes down to is like, what is that message? Again, I am not telling you to get rid of this piece. 
and what the questions have brought up or the comments have brought up is again your attachment to this piece and how it is as I've been aware of debated amongst them so you have to decide within yourself but what I purported is when your membership evolves and becomes my di more diverse is what your goal is if it becomes a topic of feeling unwelcomed, I think you all need to be more open about switching it out. You don't have to do it today, you don't have to do it at all, but that's, if, the, if you're trying to align with your mission and goal, that's what it is. Again, I said this was aesthetically pleasing, and it looks like terrain, and I also gave an example of how it could be about neurons, and um, you all gave your different opinions on it, and that is, you know, some people consider that decent art, like it lends to conversation, but if the conversation um, conflicts with your, your mission tools, like I find harm in it, or someone comes with, in with the actual history of it, and it, it, it goes against your individuality and your, the principles of your church, then is it worth it to keep debating? I, I would say no, but that would be up to you all. So um, it's getting late. I suggest that we have one more question. Uh, and I'm hoping that the final question isn't about the Geordie Bonet Me sculpture. <laughs> May I, Eddie? Go ahead. I had the um, privilege of walking through an art fair yesterday with a five-year-old. Okay. And I wish, I know that it's not true. <laughs> But I wish we could all see the world as a five-year-old does and be in touch with how we respond to art and how we create as artists um, as a five-year-old does. And five-year-olds see things purely. Yes, they have a perspective based on their history through their five years, but they're so pure. And um, to see, what a child has to say about abstract work is it's just fascinating so I guess I try to put myself in touch with my five-year-old self <laughs> when I experience artwork I'm also an artist and I paint with a friend one day a week after a 35-year career applying my art and sometimes we wash away our art when we're done and sometimes we cut it up and you know it's the process that's important also and what you're thinking while you're creating. Um, I'm not going to say a thing about the sculpture up front, um, except that we each do have our own interaction and experience with artwork. And isn't that what it's about? Artists are trying to create a dialogue with other people. And so everything you create, I plan to visit your gallery. I do visit different places where artwork is being created and experience it firsthand, and it's a dialogue. And um, so I think we just all throw ourselves into that dialogue if we're not already engaged, and um, appreciate you being here. And I hope we all keep listening to one another. Um, I, I'll give my personal opinion on something, but I would like for you to react to it. When I saw the quilt hanging as you come in. On the brown wall. On the brown wall. Um, I can only look at it through my lens, but I would like to hear when you see that quilt, what do you see through your lens? And I just want to listen to that. So there's a few things I want to comment on when you say um, art is about dialogue, and people's comfort with the dialogue depends on your vantage point in your life. And so there might be conversations that are uncomfortable for you and that you have to rectify what, what, why you're dis what, what is the root of your discomfort if it doesn't align with um, somebody else's. And again, it's about, my, my work here is about helping you decolonize because the conversations, you're not aware of the conversations you might be having or what the, the language you are emitting because of who you are um, and because of our histories. Um, I work with artists from all walks of life 
and there are artists who work on the concept of play anyway as well. And so, yes, I, we encourage people to have like a childlike wonder and appreciation, but you know, we still have to be, have like mature conversations about what happens in the world too that we try to um, shield children from um, and change that. And then by, through your works, you know, have, making it okay to talk about things that are, you know, real as well. The quilt, I can't tell you what it looks like. I can see the colors and I remember general aesthetics, but again, the work that is up, my task was to place it aesthetically. So I'm looking at scale, balance and color. Um, there, was, there are two of those quilts, I believe. They're similar, pairing them with each other and balancing out the space. So that wasn't me decolonizing it. It was just placing, and that was the initial assignments to help make it more aesthetically welcoming um, and, and activating the collection that wasn't necessarily visible. So I can't, I don't have a response to like what I see. I would have to look at it. But my, my our taste is, is gonna vary from what I see. I can tell you that. So would it be a, please, a piece that I would collect for a space? No, not innately. I would have to have a conversation with you and say, you know, what do you like? What's the message and all that stuff? And then I will go find probably more contemporary stuff. But I just place what you have. So I don't have an attachment to your, your work like you do. Besides making it look like a complete um, and aesthetically pleasing place. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima, and thank you all. <laughs> this is clearly a conversation that needs to continue. And as you can get a little bit of a taste of what our, our task force has been talking about for the past year. Um, so uh, please join with us in continuing that conversation as we go forward. Jenny now has a special music piece. I would like, because it's a little late, I'd like to suggest that we drop the final hymn, if that's okay with everybody. Jenny, is that okay with you? <laughs> All right. Thank you. As you know, each month we give half of all undesignated offerings to a local nonprofit to address human needs and advance social justice in our community. Our split the plate partner for mid-July through August is Milwaukee Inner City Congregations Allied for Hope, also known as MICA. MICA is a multiracial interfaith organization committed to justice, 
issues of greatest importance to Milwaukee, a city afflicted with radicalized and concentrated poverty. MICA was the founding member in 1988 of WISDOM, a statewide network of faith-based organizations well known to most UUCW members. They are committed to training and empowering ordinary people to do extraordinary things. MICA has eight major programs, including lead emergency, criminal justice, education, health equity, jobs and equi uh, economic development, racial equity, transportation, and we all belong. Each one is well described under our work tab on the website if you want to know more, micamke.org, micamke.org. So to support MICA today, uh, you can do any of the following. You can add um, undesignated offerings to the basket. You can go to UUCW's donate uh, website to the donate tab. Um, text your donation to 73256 or mail your donation to UUCW at our address. Thank you for your generosity and we will now gratefully receive your offering. <laughs> Now please join in the words for the dedication of the offering, which are printed in your order of service. To the work of this community, which is to ground ourselves in love and joy and to act for inclusion and justice, we dedicate ourselves and these offerings. Our closing words are adapted from Our Work Has Just Begun by Emily Richards. Please take a moment to become present, to pause and notice how you are in this moment. Our work here this morning is at an end and our work has just begun. The work of holding one another and this community in love. The work of trusting that we are on the right path the work of believing that what connects us is stronger than what separates us. The work of engaging in that which makes us whole. The work of deeper understanding and commitment. The work of letting go of that which does not serve us. The work of radical inclusion. The work of anti-racism. The work of collective liberation. The work of this beloved community, a beloved community of which we are all a part, a place where we are welcomed, respected, valued, cherished, a place where we belong. Go in peace. Amen and blessed be.